All right, if you're just joining us, we're going to get started in just a moment. Uh, folks are in breakout rooms, and they'll be rejoining us here shortly. All right. We'll be All right, folks are rejoining us now from their breakout rooms. We'll be back in about 10 seconds. Here they are. Everyone's back. Just about. All right, once again, thank you so much for coming to Sunday Morning Zen. We're so happy to have all of you. Hope you had a wonderful time catching up, those of you who are in breakout rooms. And as you can see, we've rearranged the Buddha Hall here. We're ready for this morning's speaker. Before I do that, um, I just wanted to point out, we've been doing a lot of work here at ZLMC of late to kind of prepare and do a digital transformation uh, of the Zen Center. For, so for the folks who are here, a lot of you are seeing for the first time, we have our our uh, camera and television screen here. We're also equipped up in the community room for hybrid events as well. And uh, I appreciate your patience as we do this um, because we know that uh, for the foreseeable future, at least this is kind of the future of how we're gonna be meeting. But again, for those of you who are local, we're excited to have you rejoining us with masks if you're fully vaccinated. And uh, we kind of did this digital transformation uh, by faith or on faith and it was on faith that that would be that we'd be doing the right thing and that we could count on your support going forward so uh we'd really appreciate it uh while you have a moment <laughs> Pardon me, I had to mask or mute a participant. Uh, if you would sincerely, you would consider uh, donating to the center. Uh, it really makes a big difference for us. Uh, and it makes the, creates the ability to do programs like Sunday Morning Zen and Commit to Sit and all the other things that you appreciate um, online, but as well as these hybrid programs that we're starting right now. So it's with great joy, and it's a great honor I have to introduce this morning's speaker. He doesn't need an introduction. He's our abbot. And uh, he's going to be talking to us this morning about silent illumination. Good morning, everyone. So this is um, August 8th, so I, I could just take a moment to remember that on this uh, on uh, August 6th and on August 9th, one day later from today, about 75 years ago, we dropped two atomic bombs on uh, Japan, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, respectively. And I'd like just to take a moment of silence to remember that and all for all of us to commit to doing whatever we can to make sure Nothing like that ever happens again in our world. Thank you. Can you all hear me online? Just checking. We're doing hybrid. We have people here in the Buddha Hall. We have those of you far away or near on Zoom, and we are now a hybrid Sangha, near and far, wherever you may be, welcome to this uh, Sunday Morning Zen program and to my talk this morning. I'd like to talk about silent illumination. Um, 
you know, we teach the foundations of mindfulness here, and in those, uh, in that eight eight part course, we basically teach two kinds of mindfulness: what's shamatha, what we call one point of attention, and vipassana, which we call open awareness practice. And uh, it's easy. Uh, we might actually assume that once you've taken that course, that that's the end of meditation practice, but it really isn't. It's just the beginning. And um, so we need to make a really clear distinction between mindfulness and awareness. And uh, this morning I'm going to talk about the awareness practice, which is unique to our Chan Buddhist tradition or our Zen tradition called silent illumination, or as it's uh, spoken of in Japan, uh, Japan, shikantaza, which means just sitting. It's important to make uh, to understand the difference between mindfulness and awareness speaking broadly. We all have to start somewhere to begin meditation and where we start is with a mindfulness practice of training the mind to pay attention to one thing at a time counting the breath. This involves agency. It involves hard work. It involves setting yourself down and being with yourself long enough to settle the mind, pacify the mind, to begin to, begin to cut through the speediness of your own mind. And that's a very important uh, entry practice for meditation, but it's certainly not the end. And what happens now a lot, I think, in, in the West is mindfulness is being taught in all kinds of different contexts, and basically the method or the fruition of the practice gets talked about some benefit for what, whatever suffering you have, but then what is forgotten is why we have the mindfulness in the first place, which is to wake up. It's a practice to begin a spiritual path of waking up and beginning to work with our uh, conditioning. So uh, the next uh, development then in meditation practice is what we call Vipassana, which means penetrating insight. And now we speak of that as an awareness. So you're moving into a more subtle kind of meditation. There is still a reference point in the breath. Instead of counting the breath, you're moving out with the breath into space. But it's more of an awareness practice just because there's less of you doing it. It's sort of doing you at this point. Hopefully you've uh, done enough uh, one point of attention practice to internalize the meditation and then you can relax more. And as you relax more, you get out of the way. And then awareness arises, uh, not from your thinking, but from actually not thinking. It's a kind of subtraction. It's a letting go. And we can, uh, and that gets taken much further in the Zen tradition. And so I'm going to talk about this this morning. It's called silent illumination. Um, it was a practice developed in Chan, Chan Buddhist circles in China. Uh, it sounds like a practice or a method, but actually it is not. It's a realization of the nature of reality right here, right now. And the, if there is a practice for it, it's called shikantaza, which means just sitting. But, um, and this practice is often uh, kind of stereotypically associated with Soto. So then there's all kinds of misconceptions. People say, well, if you're doing Cohen study, then you wouldn't do shikantaza. Or if you're doing shikantaza, you don't do Cohen study. That's nonsense. Everyone does shikantaza, whether you're doing Cohen study or not. Some people just do shikantaza and don't do Cohen study. That's fine. But uh, shikantaza or uh, silent illumination is a really important uh, uh, aspect of our spiritual path. It doesn't really belong to any school. Um, it's not a fixed meditation method. In Zen, there is no method.
if there was a method, there'd be somebody doing it. And the point here is that in the beginning practice of mindfulness, we, we talk about the watcher and, and it's sort of developing a meta awareness of what you're doing. And that watcher is extremely important. But once we get to the, the place of awareness practice, the watcher has to go. Because the watcher is getting in between reality and reality. There's just, there's just reality, but as long as there's some dualistic separation of me and reality, there's a watcher and that has to be let go of to move into a, a silent illumination practice. The basic principle of our tradition is that we are intrinsically awake as we are. And therefore, you're already free. And it's because of our self referential grasping that we don't that that truth is concealed from us. Because of our conditioning. And we're all conditioned by our culture by what we think of as reality and because we live in a materialistic culture it uh, it we've learned that reality is the physical forms we see around us that's not at all what reality is from the point of view of our zen tradition that's a delusion and that that separation of reality into physical forms creates suffering creates conditioning creates attachment grasping I'm gonna to wanna to pass this mic around, so I may be able, uh, I asked June to change the, and you can ask, you can answer this online or you can answer it in the room, but uh, the other night when I was teaching the foundation class, uh, Jeremy in the class asked a really good question. He said, well, what is spirituality? What is spiritual? What does that mean? So before I try to answer that, what do you think it is? It's a good question. And I'm going to ask June to move the microphone if, around if someone is, if you're answering it in the room, but you can also answer it online and I'll just put it out to you. What is, what spiritual mean to you for a spiritual path? What is spirituality? And why are we using that word here? Anybody? I would say to be in tune with nature. What? To be in tune with nature. Okay, why am I saying it is to be in tune with nature? Oh, you get that to do my camera. The thing I it's a little complicated. Yeah, Python said to be in tune with nature, okay? Anybody else? It'd be hard to see that. Just right up your instant. To be searching for or to be searching for or aware of reality. Be searching for or aware of reality. Aware of reality. Aware of reality. Okay. So we could uh, we could um, have a lovely discussion here about just about what is spiritual, but I think in most religious traditions, uh, in a theistic tradition, they would say spiritual is often associated with the human spirit or the soul as opposed to mental or physical things. Yes, and I think we could say that in our um, in our Zen tradition, when we speak of spiritual, we're we're speaking of a reality that is beyond the material and physical world, and it cannot be proved by science. Doesn't mean there's anything the matter with science. It just doesn't. It just means science can't go here. And in our tradition, we would speak of this: the realization of our true nature, our Buddha nature. 
which is simply freedom from being a thing, <clears throat> freedom from being a form, an object, a fixed thing. If Buddha nature were a thing, you would have a before and after, and it would be subject to birth and death, and it would be either permanent or impermanent, but it is none of those. Buddha nature is inconceivable. So how do we trust clarify and realize something that is inconceivable to our conceptual mind. What our culture tells us is real, our consensual reality is part of our conditioning. And we internalize these constructs and assumptions, and there are consequences for that. There's can, there are um, all kinds of consequences, and we call it, in our tradition, we call this karma. Karma is an inside job. You can't blame anyone else for your karma. It's yours. When you, when you're, when you go home tonight and go to bed, you're, you're going to bed with yourself. Hopefully you're going, you may be going to bed with a partner, which would be lovely, but you're, you're basically stuck with yourself at the end of the day. And you can blame other people for it, but it won't, it, you're still stuck with your own suffering. Karma is the nature of suffering. And our practice to wake up is to clarify and begin to work through that karmic conditioning so that we don't keep doing it and that we clean it up as much as we can. Yeah, I don't think it's, I think it's important not to be idealistic about this. We all have conditioning and we're all doing the best we can. And you can wake up and still have conditioning. <laughs> you don't have to, you know, be pure before you wake up or else you might never wake up. But waking up can really help you clarify what, how you create suffering. But what do we learn from the culture? Our consensual reality teaches us that we are separate. There's a physical world out there, it seems like it. There's all these forms, and then there's my body here. I can, I can, yeah, I can feel my body. It must be real. That's what the culture tells us. I think part of the karma of that conditioning that we all carry with us is some kind of insecurity about what actually is here, how we are actually here, because it feels like something is missing, something is lacking. And in one way or another, the culture is telling us we're in the wrong place. And if you wanna be in the right place, buy this brand, Whatever it is, buy this pillow, you'll sleep better. Take this, eat this, go on this diet, you're, you'll lose a lot of weight and then you'll never, you'll be happy forever. Now meditation grounds us right here, right now. And the body is our base camp. We can't go without, we have to, to return to the body. There's no, we're not talking about transcending the, 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 the physical nature of our world. But there's a lovely uh, image of the Buddha touching the earth. I'm sure you've seen it with his right hand. He's sitting in a complete composure in meditation. He's reaching down and touching the earth. And the story about that image is that the Buddha was in a period of his life where he was full of doubt and uncertainty. And so he realized that he couldn't trust his mind, his mental faculty, but he could trust the earth. He could trust the body. And so he was touching. Uh, to me, that's a very moving and kind of poignant 
uh, story about the Buddha. We think of the Buddha as being infallible, and he was a human being like us, too. And uh, usually we trust our mental thoughts more than we trust the actual physical body that we occupy and the earth that we're standing on, which is actually a lot more real in many ways than the, the thoughts we have in our head. But we just do the reverse. There's a story of the uh, Mullah Nasruddin, the Persian fool and the wise man. He was having an affair with his friend's wife. And when his friend returned home, Mullah hid in the closet in the bedroom. And his friend, suspecting that something was off, burst into the bedroom and opened the closet. And he found, he found, um, he found him in the, he found Mullah in the closet and he asked him, he said, what are you doing here? And Mullah said, well, everybody has to be somewhere. <laughs> That's a problem. Our conditioning keeps us paying attention to somewhere else other than where we actually are. You might say that we're just paying attention to the wrong thing. We're, we're looking at the play, at the theater production, and we're completely uh, consumed with the play, but we don't, we don't stop to realize that there's behind the curtain, there's all kinds of stuff going on to make the play possible. There's costumes and makeup, and people back there working with lights and backdrops and all kinds of stuff. And without those people behind the curtain, the play wouldn't be possible. And awareness is, our attention is usually on the foreground. But awareness brings a, uh, an awareness of what's in the background that makes the foreground possible. And that's really important. Another uh, analogy or metaphor we might use is of a room. We're in a room and we have furniture in the room, we have tables, we have an altar, we have a microphone, we have a big TV screen, which many of you are appearing on. So we have all kinds of stuff in the room and that's usually what we pay attention to. But what are we missing when we just pay attention to the furniture? What are we missing? Yeah, the room. <laughs> The room doesn't change, the furniture does, it gets moved around, you know, and we have it, we are attached to our furniture too, you know, I got this couch from my grandmother has been passed down, and so forms carry with them narratives and stories. I know where we got that altar. So our Buddha nature is like the room. We don't notice the room, we just notice the furniture and then we rearrange it. So one of the teachers that spoke a lot about silent illumination. So silent, let me break that down for a moment. Silent illumination. Silence is referring to the awareness, which is unconditional which is not dualistic. So silence is not the same as quietness. Quietness depends on there being no noise. If we open the doors here in the Buddha hall, the train's gonna come by at some point and it will sound noisy to us because we're trying to sit meditation and our quietness has been interrupted by the train. We used to, when we first started in Hawaii, we, I built a zendo over our garage next, we had a neighbor next door and we would sit weekend retreats and we'd be in this deep quietness of meditation and my neighbor, John Balaam would come out and mow his lawn on Saturday. Well, of course he's gonna mow his lawn, it's Saturday. <laughs> but I got upset because he interrupted my meditation. So if you think of, if you're, Notice that quietness depends on external circumstances. 
which change, but silence doesn't. Silence has no reference point. You see? Awareness has no reference point. And that no reference point is really important about in terms of waking up. Because the reference point is how we create ourselves. It's how we construct things. It's how we construct the world that we perceive. And then, so the silence is the formless awareness. And then the illumination is how that form functions in the world. How that formlessness arises as, as forms, how it functions. And when we put the two together, there are, we could, we might say there's stages in practice, but it's dangerous to say so, because then it sounds linear. But it may be helpful to clarify that when we're, when we're practicing silent illumination, the first duality that we kind of resolve is the internal sense of a separate self, and that goes away. That reference point is no longer there. And then the second aspect of this practice is that you start to see that the external world also is not separate. And then you, the two get integrated completely, the external world and the internal. And the beautiful thing about silent illumination is that we are completely integrating the formless with the function, wisdom with compassion. And that is the essence of our Chan tradition is to integrate both. You might think be attached to one or the other, but they, go, they come together as an integrated practice, which is engaged in the world, but also not of the world in the way that our normal conditioning tells us about the world. So let me read you this uh, beautiful uh, uh, Hong Chi Cheng Chui, lived from uh, 1091 to 1157. He was a Chinese um, Chan master, and he wrote very poetically about the silent illumination. He never presented it as a method or a technique. Um, he taught that silent illumination was a natural awakening that is inherent in every human being. And he described it as a vacant and open field, a lucid lake, and our original home. So here's what he says of it. It, silent illumination, cannot be practiced nor actualized because it is something intrinsically full and complete. Others cannot defile it. It is thoroughly pure to its depth. Precisely at the place where purity is full and complete is where you must open your eyes and recognize it. When illumination is thorough, the self is relinquished completely. Experiencing is clear. Your steps are then solid and grounded. Notice how much we talk about mindfulness can ground you. Well, that's a benefit of mindfulness. But we can get attached to the, the benefit. And say, oh, that's why I'm practicing mindfulness. That's a mistake. The mistaken view from the point of the Buddhist tradition. Right view is to have no view at all. Right view is not to have a fixed point of view. Notice how easily we do that with mindfulness. We create, oh, I'm doing mindfulness to, to be grounded. Yeah, sure, it, it'll help. But we practice mindfulness in our tradition as a way of clarifying uh, the nature of reality so we can wake up and we can uh, begin to address uh, suffering and how we create it so that we can be more skillful in the world in terms of healing suffering. That's why we practice mindfulness, not for ourselves just to be peaceful. Dogen said, you know, to study Buddhism is to study the self. We have to study ourselves and we have to look. And if we look closely, which is what, why we're practicing mindfulness is it allows us to start to get closer to what's here. Then the next thing Dogen says, studying Buddhism is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. When you really look closely here, 
There is no self. You will find no self. Where is the self? Can you locate it? Where is your self? It is in your big toe. <laughs> Maybe it's in your stomach when you're hungry. Can you really find yourself? It's actually really nebulous and fluid and, and uh, ambiguous when we actually look carefully without looking away with mindfulness and awareness and you start to inquire. That's why Vipassana is called penetrating insight because we start to use this quality of awareness to investigate reality and ourselves. And what we find is no self. So another thing that uh, um, Huangji said is the correct way to practice is simply to sit in stillness and silently investigate. Deep down, one reaches a state where externally one is no longer swayed by causes and conditions. The mind being empty is all embracing, its luminosity being wondrous, it is precisely apt and impartial. And the Tibetans often speak of the mind as luminous and spacious. The real true nature of mind, when we don't muddy it up, is luminous. Sometimes the Chinese uh, used uh, two characters to talk about this investigating our experience. They used uh, the word, the character Ju or the, or the character Khan. And they both have the meaning of partaking or integrating or thoroughly penetrating something. And then sometimes they would use a further character T which mean D, which means embodiment or experiencing. So it meant to be lived, it's meant to be a lived, experienced uh, realization. It's not merely a, a passive intellectual pastime, it's your life. So again, the notion here is silent illumination. It doesn't just take place on the cushion or when you're meditating, it takes place in every aspect of your life. And you're encouraged in our tradition to bring that, that open awareness into every mundane uh, thing that you're doing. The full catastrophe of living, that is the Buddhist teaching. It's do it with everything, eating, shitting, sitting, sleeping, arguing, everything. Raising kids, being in a pandemic. That's why it's not a method. It's not a method of meditation. It's what happens when we meditate and clarify what is actually here. And then we, we bring that into the rest of our lives because there's a, there's a truthfulness about it and a sanity that we just can't avoid anymore. Once you see it, you can't, you can't unsee it so to speak, unless you really work hard to deny. Yeah, I, guess, I suppose you can if you work hard, but it's a lot easier just to open up and wake up because that's your natural state. You're, we're naturally intrinsically awake. It takes a, you have to work hard to, to keep stirring up trouble and turmoil. So it's important to be clear that our true nature, what is true here, has always been true, which is, has, is not conditioned, has no dualistic quality that we could ascribe to it, is, um, it's obscured by our emotional afflictions, but it's not defined by them. Yeah, so um, our true nature is always here. It's, it's always, it's, 
it's been here before you were born and it'll be here after you die because it is not subject to conditioning. It has no, it, it has nothing to do with time or space or any conceptual category that we could ascribe to it. It's inconceivable. It's ungraspable. Can you put your faith in that? Can you actually live with that experience and be okay with that and say, I don't need something more, add something to it. So that true nature, which we all are, is obscured by our emotional afflictions, but it's not defined by them. It's like the room and the furniture. The furniture changes, but the room doesn't. The spaciousness of the room is the silence, the emptiness. There's that big word we use, and when you use the word emptiness, people think, oh my gosh, that's so deep, or that's so whatever, that's uh, nihil nihilistic, it's a terrible teaching. Uh, I don't understand it. It's not meant to be understood. Other words might make it more accessible. Let's just call it the formless. Not what's not what's not a form. There's no forms here. The external forms we're attached to are all constructions from our culture of consensual reality. If awakening were something you could gain through a method or a practice, it would just be another piece of furniture in the room. Whatever can be gained can be lost. You can't gain your true nature. You can't lose it. You can't possess it. It's not yours. So, um, so here's some more uh, words from uh, another Zen master in China, Guan Wu Keqin. He says, directly, your mind should resemble a withered log and a rotten tree stump, like a person who has gone through a great death, who no longer breathes, moment to moment, without knowing, instant to instant, without abiding. Even a thousand sages can't call you out of this state. Then it may be possible to be like the blossoming of flowers on a withered tree. You should be able to bring forth boundless responses and exhibit the great lively function of kindness and compassion. Yeah. So in this silent illumination is both uh, what we call a apophatic approach or via sometimes referred to as via negativa that involves knowing something by affirming that which is it is not so for example emptiness is an example of that it's not this and it's not that it can't be grasped because it's not a thing we have a lot of these apoph Apophatic, how do you pronounce it? Apophatic? Apophatic uh, expressions in Buddhism. If you've ever chanted the Heart Sutra, you know what I'm talking about. No eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. No birth and death. No wisdom, no, no lack of wisdom. No, 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 no. Boy, it sounds so negative. Ah. Oh. But then there's also the, the opposite of that, which would be called, uh, um, I have to find the word, a, a big word, another big word. Um, cataphatic, which means positive, via positive language, the blossoming flowers on a withered tree. That's the positive functioning of compassion, of a form of uh, functioning within the formless.
So this balance between the negative and the positive, so just to put it kind of grossly, is really a basic principle of our Zen practice and uh, our spiritual path. And we often speak of now of living a Zen inspired life, of being balanced or integrated. And we're, we can say that on all kinds of levels. In the ultimate sense, it's the integration of the formless awareness with the form. With wisdom and compassion being integrated completely seamlessly, married. In the foundation classes now we speak of it as the four foundation, the four pillars of wellness and we identified four pillars there are other there are many different systems now where people talk about pillars. <laughs> pillars of wellness, but we could say wellness is. In the deepest sense of the word wellness is an integration, which is what we mean by silent illumination it means seeing reality clearly without delusion, without blinders, just seeing what's here. So we can say there's, that's a, that's a, in order to see what's here, we have to have a balance in our attention. We have to have a balance in our motivation. We have to have a balance around insight and a balance around relational and connection is how we connect with others. So those, Four areas, motivation, attention, insight, and connection are all areas where we're practicing to integrate so that we have balance. So let's just take, we could break these down and talk about, like if we talk about motivation, we could say, if you don't have enough motivation, you have too little, and it's not balanced because if you have too little motivation for this spiritual path, you, you'll forget about it pretty soon. There'll be another shiny object that comes along that will get your attention and your obsession. And before you know it, you're doing that and you forgot all about the Dharma. It happens all the time. So there needs, you need to have enough intention to, to, to stay and do this practice, which is not always easy, but you could have too much intention too. That would also be out of balance. What would it mean to have too much intention, too much motivation? Maybe you're attached to the outcome too much. So you actually aren't practicing here in the present because you're already out, your skis got way out ahead of you. You're thinking about that wonderful Kensho experience that you wanna have. That's too, that's the wrong kind of intention, right? It's too much intention, or you're trying too hard. You're still practicing mindfulness with too much willpower. It doesn't work that way. You got it. It's about getting out of the way. At some point, you have to do that fairly soon once you start meditation practice, or you just make yourself miserable. You'll create more suffering. And then you could have a dysfunctional kind of intention. You could have an intention that to do something here that doesn't benefit your, doesn't create wellness as the fruition of what you're doing. Maybe you, your intention is to be a great spiritual superstar and be recognized worldwide as a, a famous and wonderful Zen practitioner or a poet or a Zen teacher, or whatever. That would be sort of a dysfunctional intention. Yeah? because your intention is based on something that is not going to lead to wellness. It's gonna to lead to the opposite of wellness. And then you could have optimal wellness, uh, optimal intention, I mean, which would mean that you have a balanced intention. You have a strong motivation to do this practice, to do it regularly. And you're not, you know, there's a, we could say there's a, it is important to have a map. So there's a map about waking up and but you're not too concerned about 
where you're going to get because you already have enough faith that this practice is sane and you, you're going to do it regardless of uh, the, any daily knocks at, or, you know, things that come along. You're just going to do it. That would be a strong, optimal motivation. And you need motivation to do a spiritual path of practice or you just won't do it. You need attention. And again, we could go through any of these four pillars and look at them in terms of how they could be out of balance and what it would mean to have an optimal quality of attention. Optimal quality of attention moves into awareness where you get out of the way. You cannot have awareness through thought. Can't do it. Awareness isn't about thinking. So I'll conclude so we have a little time for discussion. I'll say one last uh, quote from Hui Nung, our wonderful sixth six Chinese patriarch. And he says, good friends, since the past, this teaching of ours has first taken no thought as its principle, no form as its essence, and non-abiding as its foundation. No thought means to be without thought in the midst of thinking. Figure that one out. No form is to transcend form within the context of forms and appearances. Non-abiding is our fundamental nature. All worldly things are empty. Three things there. Our thoughts, our feelings, our narratives are all what we grasp at internally. And Wei Nung here is saying, practice no thought. And then, he, so first we, we see clearly internally that there's the thoughts and the narratives that we're attached to have created this self and they're based on fear. And then no form means to see the external world <clears throat> is no longer separate from, from my experiencing of it. There is no duality here. There is no subject and object, no form. And we could say there's all kinds of forms that we grasp at and we're attached to. Body, objects, environment, status, wealth, appearances, fame and fortune. And then the last one, non-abiding just means, in Zen, it just means not grasping, non-attachment. The opposite of thinking, grasping, and abiding is contentment. The Buddha said, someone asked the Buddha, what is your teaching? He said, I teach suffering and the, uh, what's the word he used? The absence of suffering, the, uh, the cessation of suffering. That's all he said. I teach about suffering and the cessation of suffering. Such a singular thought and simple statement is very clarifying. And we could just remember that when we get confused about what we're doing here. It, it puts everything in focus. So that's my talk for today. And I wanted to leave just a little time for um, questions or comments and we'll uh, what? I'll just repeat the question. We're not going to pass the mic around, apparently. Okay, thank you. Any uh, comments, questions? Just to say thank you, Roshi. This was, this was beautiful and powerful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Sensei has a, a hand up. So how do you factor in the 
Uh, well, emotions are, um, you, you try to, the, the practice would be to try to intervene before you get too carried away by the emotion, because once you get in the freight train of it, it's very hard to intervene. So in terms of the, what we would call the four foundations of mindfulness, and the second foundation of mindfulness is working with um, uh, the emotional tone. And you would you would notice uh, the practice would be to notice that this this emotion is pleasant or unpleasant or neutral, and then you, the practice would be to stay with the whatever that was without further uh, solidifying the emotion through your thought. So you notice that that you actually aren't really embodied with it. You're up in your head telling a story. So the practice would be to come back into the embodied experience of the emotion, which is much more fluid and not nearly so solid. And, and then notice that actually the, the emotion might go, go away like a cloud in the sky. But the reason it doesn't is because your narrative is continually re-solidifying it and creating a drama around it, which is not really necessary if you're practicing with it. Anybody else? First, I name. I'm sitting with the, the statement of thinking and awareness. If one is, how is one aware of the state of not thinking? Question makes sense. Um, the question is, how, how would you be aware of the state of not thinking? Well, you just wouldn't be thinking about it. There's no other way of knowing. No, awareness is not knowing. Awareness is actually letting go. The problem with knowing and thinking is that we are, there's, nothing, there's no problem with thinking. The problem is when we try to have a fixed point of view in our thinking, and solidify it, then we are grasping to the thought as being uh, intrinsically true in a solid way, which it's not. So there's no problem with thinking. The problem is that we get attached to our thinking very quickly, and then we create something out of it that's not there. So there's a kind of, uh, in the first stage, I think in terms of shamatha practice and moving into Vipassana, there's a kind of meta-awareness and we do this practice in the foundations. If you actually, in fact, just do it right now. Just, just close your eyes and whatever, just uh, pay attention to whatever thought is in your, wherever it is in your body, mind, heart, whatever is here. And just notice how it comes into your awareness and, and how it hangs around and how it goes. And now whatever thought might be in your mind, see, hang on to it. Really, don't let it go. Don't let it go for a moment. See how long that lasts. And I think if you do this, the problem is that we don't really, we're not curious enough about our actual experience to do this. We, make, we have all kinds of assumptions about reality. One of the assumptions we have is our thoughts are very real. And so, uh, unlike the Buddha, we don't actually have enough uh, presence of mind to reach down and touch the earth when our thoughts are creating trouble for us. We actually try to figure it out with more thought, and which is just uh, uh, creating more trouble. So the, the thinking itself is not particularly bad. It's how we, we grasp and attach to it and turn it into a fixed uh, position that is the problem. <laughs> and it 
she is so much more than just the piece of her that has to do with me. That's how I see her, and that's how I can deal with her. So whenever I deal with her, it's all these thoughts, like holding on to this furniture, and how it should be moved, and the furniture's moved, and she will change, and we will change. And I'm completely disregarding all of who she is, the endlessness of who she is, and then mm -hmm. getting into the pilots that we don't have the time to do that. And if I truly believe that she is the you know, nature, then I'm really disregarding all of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let me rephrase what Jackie just said here. She's talking about the going back to the notion of the furniture in the room, and that Jackie's afraid she might just be a couch in the room, and then her mother might be another piece of furniture in the room, and that it's hard for you to see your mother as the room itself. But we're all practicing with the furniture is where we practice. You know, we're not practicing with the room. The room is, uh, we practice with the furniture. That's where we're, that's where we live and sit and sleep and whatever. So you can't avoid it. We're not suggesting there's anything the matter with the furniture. But if you see your mother as just uh, the couch or uh, the TV set or something, then you're missing a whole lot of what your mother is. She's also the room. And that's the point here. Again, I think really we should appreciate how much we create assumptions and constructs from consent, from our culture, and all cultures do this, we, and from a very early age on, and we create a consensual reality that says, my thoughts are real. Therefore, I must try to figure everything out through my thoughts, which now becomes more of an obsession for, well, now I want to be in control through my thoughts. And if I, if I let go of my thoughts, I would no longer be in control. And boy, that would really not go well. That's what we assume based on our conditioning. And everything in our tradition is saying, any time, but especially in a time like now, when everything is disrupted, it would be really skillful to have right view, which would be to, to not have a view, because then you can be flexible. Then when they say they mandate that we wear masks in Oak Park, we wear masks. We don't, it doesn't matter what, what our opinion is of it or what we think about it. That's the truth of our community, and we're going to follow it. Uh, you know, I stop at red lights. I don't, I don't uh, there's rules in the culture that we follow. But there's also rules to suffering and conditioning that we create through around language and separation and that create, that's what we call karma and conditioning. And part of our practice is to see this clearly and uh, realize how much we have bought in to all kinds of assumptions and constructs that we haven't even examined at all. We just, just and in many cases, they're unconscious. And then the practice starts to bring this stuff up. You start to look at a little bit more closely at your thoughts, and you notice, wow, I can't hang on to a thought for longer than five or 10 seconds, and it goes out the window. And then you realize, it, well, this, it's not a solid thing. So it's 10.59, so I think that's enough for one morning. I want to thank you all for coming to Sunday Morning Zen. Please be safe. I hope you, were, uh, I hope you will get vaccinated if you're not. Take care of your families. Be safe. Take care of your community. We are living through a very difficult time, and it's important to be kind to everyone, regardless of their point of view, their politics, or whether we agree or disagree with them. Let's be kind and respectful of everyone, even the people that don't want to get vaccinated. They're the uh, conscientious objectors in our, no, let's be kind even to the people that we disagree with. And uh, we're not gonna change anyone's minds by uh, demonizing them. The only way in is to, to really 
be kind and compassionate with everyone. Okay, and uh, please pra practice uh, shikantaza. I mean, it's just sitting. Just sit and notice, uh, uh, well, just enjoy the playing in the pure land. It's, it's always here, it's always been here. We just, we just miss it because we're looking in the wrong place. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that's, that's pretty powerful, showing everyone in the room. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.